Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century. Collective bargaining for agriculture. Every American can profit by the successful NFO collective bargaining program for farm income sets the nation's prosperity. U.S. Farm Report presents NFO Roundtable with moderator Hugh Crane. For those of us who are in the National Farmers Organization, it is particularly rewarding for us to know that there are areas that are being added to our organizational efforts every day. And you see the symbol of the map with the collective bargaining emblem and the NFO emblem in it on your programs quite often. Tonight we have gathered together people who are going to represent areas of this area of this United States and it would do well for us to look at this point as to how far in the United States collective bargaining through the NFO program has actually moved out so that you might have an idea of the area we now encompass. NFO, as you know, began in the central area of the United States, uh, in Iowa and in the Missouri area. From there, we spread out in all directions, but let's move westward first, up through the Nebraska's, Kansas, Colorado, <coughs> on clear out into Idaho. Then we swept south, down into Arkansas, across the Mississippi River, into the Upper Ohio, Indiana, Illinois regions, on clear up into New Jersey, New York, across the Appalachians. Then we moved down the coast, down into the areas of Virginia, Georgia, and just lately we have had memberships coming in from Florida at quite a great rate. And then back across the southern section, so that now you can see we encompass most all of the United States. It will be of course, our ultimate goal to have charter organizations in every state of the United States because we've had people asking us to come into their states and help them to become organized. We have gentlemen here this evening who will be talking with you from the geographic locations which were pointed out to you on the map. But before I introduce them to you, I should like to say that just the other day I received in the mail a pamphlet from the United States Department of Agriculture which illustrates better than anything I've ever found the facts of life as far as farm income is concerned. For an example, in the central northeast dairy section of this United States, there are people who have quite a bit of dairying. And the dairying industry as far as the farming end is concerned, for a farmer to actually go out and produce cows, produce milk, it takes 4,600 hours per year. In the eastern Wisconsin area, it takes 4,650 hours per year. In the central northeast area, they have an investment of something around $50,000, according to the pamphlet I'm using. And when you consider their return to the operator and to his family for the labor, you find that he only made 37 cents per hour. In the eastern Wisconsin area, they're doing just real good there. They're getting 63 cents per hour. We would like to discuss this situation with the men who are producing the milk, the men who are with us on tonight's program, and I'd like to introduce you to a gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Charles Barberry, who is in the dairy business there, and who joined the NFO a short time ago. Uh, when did you join, Mr. Barberry? Just three years ago this month. How many uh, dairy cows do you have on your farm? We have about 107, 108 cows, milking cows, and we have about 22 young head we're raising. How much milk do you uh, get from this? We average about two tons a day or 4,000 pounds of milk a day. Is uh, milk a good price in your area? Oh, terrible. 
for the cost there, we only receive, right now, we're receiving about, well, they leverage around 550, 570. That's the best. And uh, that is very hard to produce milk there at that price. And number one is our taxes are about the highest in the nation. And everything that we touch there, uh, it's, it, uh, the, the cost is very high now because you have to in, uh, think of uh, grain coming out from the west, coming out there to the east. You have your transportation problem, which uh, your freight and all that, it all adds to the cost of production. And then the farms are very expensive out there, so that it's really difficult to, uh, to uh, make that even with that price, which uh, out here the boys think it's good, but out there it is nowhere near what we should get. We should receive out there at least six dollars and seventy-five cents to seven dollars a hundred in order to make a decent living. There are some farmers in different areas, a little bit further south, that get a better price. Just exactly what there is, I don't know. Have you uh, a real lot of milk as far as uh, the amount two consumers is concerned produced in your area? No, New Jersey only produces about 30% of the milk that's consumed in the state. We have to import 70% uh, from out of state. Why do you feel then that uh, NFO can help you in uh, your area? Well, uh, we import so much milk that we have to have or belong, we have to have an organization that is nationwide, like the NFO, in order to price the milk for us. We in New Jersey cannot do it because uh, we have to import so much milk. It'd be impossible for us to price milk. So therefore, with it being uh, uh, the reason we joined and the reason the boy, the farmers are joining in the NFO uh, in New Jersey is because that uh, uh, by having a nationwide organization that we could stabilize the price, not only in New Jersey, but it would help to uh, help the farmers even around New Jersey. And that is the reason why we joined the NFO. Thank you. And uh, I also like to say this, that I think the NFO uh, is the best program that we have ever had out there in the East. This collective bargain is a wonderful thing. And the farmers out there, once they understand the uh, program, why, they, they, they join up. Sometimes it's very hard for them to understand the program. It's so good that it's unbelievable. From uh, New Jersey, let's move on over to Tennessee once. And with us, we have James <coughs> Womack, who is a farmer in Tennessee. And he tells me that uh, they have a rather large operation there. Uh, would you care to elaborate on that, Mr. Womack? Well, Hugh, we operate about uh, 1,500 acres of land. We have about 145 head of brood cows. We feed about a thousand lambs a year and about five thousand holes. I noticed that uh, you have some tobacco here too. Yes, we have uh, raised about twelve acres of tobacco. How about the uh, how about the brood cows? You say is that beef? Uh, beef cows, right? Beef cattle. Right. You feed them out, do you? Uh, times we feed the calves. Another time we sell them as feeder calves. This looks like quite a a large, elaborate operation and uh, one which you'd think would uh, be quite profitable. Uh, how, is, how is it, actually? Well, if it was so profitable, I wouldn't do so much. But, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, it just takes so much to keep up expenses there. I'd like to have more time for leisure. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't operate quite as large. Um, do you have um, hired men on your uh, farm there? Yes, we do. How about your own family? Uh, well. My son works at the bank and uh, farms on the side. Anytime he can get off the bank, he comes and helps. But uh, most of it I do myself with some few hired men. Uh, you mentioned the banking situation. I attended a conference the other day where it was uh, suggested that by 1980, we would have to be raising 500 bushel per acre corn. We'd have to be raising 200 bushel per acre soybeans. And by the 1980 period, we'd need $300,000 more of operating credit. Uh, this looks to me as if, in the first place, how can we ex be expected to produce that much? I'm not sure. I don't know the pattern that they hope that uh, we can achieve. The second thing is, it occurs to me, 
that if the local community can't possibly hope in uh, 15 years to generate enough profit to take care of our own future credit needs that there's a great big lack someplace or another in the marketing system or there, at least in our inability to make a profit. Uh, do you want to um, make a statement about the general economic trends of agriculture in your area? Well, it's, uh, it takes a lot of money to operate now. Money is tight. The return on farm investment are low. And uh, we find it increasingly <coughs> hard to get extended credit because of the low return on our operation. Uh, we could come up someday, the bankers feel like, that uh, they might lose some money on us. So it's getting a little bit hard to ex extend our credit to what to predict we're going to have to have in a few years. From North Dakota tonight, we'd like to talk just a few minutes with Mr. Ken Spitzer. He's an operator out in the Foster County area and uh, has a substantial large operation there. Would you like to tell us about that, Ken? Uh, well, I'm from North Dakota, and uh, I suppose that I joined the NFO for the primarily the same reason as these other fellows have, the low return on investment, and possibly a another reason. We have uh, six children, three boys and three girls, and I have two boys that are, are real interested in farming, and, uh, and I would like to see them uh, farm, but uh, I'm sure that they won't want to farm under the present return on investment that, that I am receiving, or they will not be able to make it come out in a few years. And it also has, this low farm income has also reflect, reflected in the rest of the community. I'm a member of the Board of Education, and we are having a real severe time to keep our school system operating in the black. And I suppose that's some of the main reasons that I join NFO. Yes, I noticed uh, when we were discussing this a minute ago that you said you farm 3,000 acres and you feed about 300 steers. Uh, you must have uh, at one time or another enlarged because you certainly didn't start that big. That's right, uh, Hugh. Uh, we have been told that if you want to keep up with the trends of farming today, that you should become large and more efficient. And this, I have realized, is not the answer to our problem because the larger and more efficient you, be, you get, uh, the more expenses you have. And if, you, if you're... If your operation is not returning you a fair return on your investment, if it isn't returning you more than what you're paying for the money that you're using to operate on, you're going backward. Yes, and I'd like to point out to you just a couple figures from this book that I mentioned to you a moment ago. In 1949, cash receipts from farm marketing in the United States amounted to $27 million $27,805,000, and our production expenses were $31,628,000,000, leaving a $9,823,000,000 realized net farm income. By 1965, instead of the $9,823,000,000 income, we had only $8,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000
feet getting too high. We're concerned with it not being high enough. We do have a lot of concentrated uh, large feedlots in our area that do the price setting of the feed. Now the problem that we're having is trying to get this production or trying to get a price for this production that we can get enough farmers to produce this feed. Uh, the problem that we run into is uh, the farmers getting the finances to be able to stay on the farm to produce this feed, not only that I buy, but that these big feedlots purchase from each producer. How about the dairy business that you're in? Has the price been going up on milk? In the past uh, three or four months, uh, the prices have increased, uh, but of course this has been through federal marketing orders. Uh, this past month, though, it is beginning to go down again. Uh, we have kind of a ideal situation out there in Colorado. We are a deficit market, similar to the man from New Jersey here. We do have two cooperatives in the state that almost 95% of the milk in the state goes through these two cooperatives. Like I say, an ideal situation where these two cooperatives could get together and get this price of this production up quite a bit. But, uh, like has happened in some of the other areas, you run into these cooperatives that aren't willing to work along with NFO. So we do have that problem there at this time. Are you, uh, is uh, NFO being organized uh, new in your area, or how long have you been in NFO, Jack? I've uh, been in for approximately three and a half years. Uh, NFO came into our area in 1963. Uh, we have grown quite a bit in that area in that time, and I think we have done pretty good. Uh, we've had the same problems that some of the other areas have had, but I think uh, all in all we're progressing uh, to where I think one of these days we'll get it done. Glad to hear that. It's always interesting to get the comments from another state as to the effectiveness of NFO. Have you had any uh, real inclination from the processors in your area that uh, they might be showing real interest in NFO. Uh, yes, we do have uh, one of the cooperatives that have agreed to work with us in every way that they possibly can for the benefit of the dairy producers. And I think this is a major breakthrough that we've made in Colorado that some of the other states have not made. This is good. Glad to hear that. From uh, Georgia tonight, I would like to talk uh, <coughs> with you to Charles Polk. He's uh, one of the newer states, from one of the newer states, one of the youngest men on this group. And uh, Charles, why don't you talk about your operation there? Thank you, Mr. Crane. <clears throat> I have about 327 acres down there with about 200 acres in row crop. And the uh, ballots up being in pine timber and permanent pasture. I grow cotton, peanuts, and corn, soybeans, being a general the major crops that I grow. I noticed you said you had some tobacco or used to have some tobacco? Yes, I used to have some tobacco, but the labor situation put me out of business. I had to go all the way mechanized, and I couldn't do it with tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't hardly know anything about tobacco, being from Minnesota. <laughs> uh, what kind of tobacco do you raise there? Fluke cured. Fluke cured? Yes, sir. Now, didn't Fluke someone cured. else say they had fluke cured tobacco here? Which gentleman was that? It's from now, Tennessee. I raised Burley. You raised Burley? Right. Do you have government programs on tobacco? Yes, we do. What do you think about that situation as far as tobacco is concerned? Well, I don't feel like we could drop government programs on tobacco at this time, and uh, I think it's the best uh, government program that we do have. In other words, our parity on tobacco is higher than it is on the other crops we have down there. Although I don't go along with the program altogether, I think we have to have it at this time. Well, you, say, you mentioned that tobacco is uh, highest as far as parity is concerned. What is the parity on tobacco? About 85 percent. And how about peanuts? About 75. And cotton? 45 and 6. Cotton isn't we're doing very good for you, No, sir, it's not. Cotton's moving out and soybeans moving in. Soybeans? Yes. Do you raise soybeans in your farm? Yes. What kind of production do you get? Well, in a normal year, we'll get about 25 to 30 bushels. This year, we had a bad crop, dry weather. Oh. We two crop that land. We plant wheat or rye on it, and in um, July we plant soybeans. In July? Yes. And when do you harvest them then? Uh, in September and October. Have you participated in the NFO collective bargaining program for soybeans? 
Uh, no, it's not on soybeans. Uh, this was my first year growing beans and had a short crop. But on uh, corn, we are, we're working on that now. Mm -hmm. And with much success. Were you at the uh, big NFO uh, workout they had there this spring? When they had this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We had a good turnout there. Why don't you tell us about that one? Well, the only way we knew how to get people in was feed them free. So we just pitched a big barbecue. We had in about 1,200 people from the surrounding counties, and it was very successful. We had Mr. Ferguson down to speak to us, and I feel like it's uh, made our organization easier than anything we could have done. When you're talking with the farmers in your area about NFO, uh, do you need to discuss with them the economics of the area, or is this a pretty well-established thing? They pretty well understand that. The greatest problem we have with uh, NFO is uh, explain the program. It's a broad program, but once we get it explained and they understand it, well, we're not having any trouble getting membership. It's progressing pretty good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, the thing that I'm not liking to hear about all of these discussions is the fact that from each of these states, we've had the same overall opinions that uh, agriculture is in just kind of a real bad shape that there isn't even an opportunity, we might say, for us to recommend to our own children that it would be advisable to stay in farming. I have uh, seen figures from time to time about the out-migration of children from the rural area, especially the age group from 15 to 20 to 25. My operation is uh, one that I would like to have the labor of my own children. I would like to um, be able to have them come home and help me. I have a fine hired man and I am glad of that. But uh, why is it at a time when all the rest of the economic sectors are doing well? As for an example, our paper at home suggested the other day that uh, the things were good in the South. The uh, farming in our area needed to be carried on uh, like they were doing in the South. And I'd like to refer you back to the lad we just talked to from Georgia and see what he thinks farming is doing for the local communities in the, the area where he lives. Well, about the same situation as this down there, Mr. Crane, the young farmers are leaving the farms. There's nothing to stay for. They realize it, and they're moving into different categories of trade. Have you some good industries right close to you? No, you sir, live? we do not. And you are uh, probably familiar. Uh, rural areas out of the south are coming to the north hunting industry. And, of course, the reason they're doing it, agriculture is sick and can't support those rural towns. Mm -hmm. That's a problem mm -hmm. we have. And, Mr. Holman, uh, how about your area? Well, I think you'll find the same thing in our area. Uh, it gets to the point where you can't get younger people in agriculture there's the investment that you've got to have to start or stay in it for the younger people it just isn't possible anymore and uh, you see the same migration into the cities where you find uh, uh, people gone into the city and finding jobs in there where they can draw 270 or 280 an hour uh, just like that paper you had a while ago uh, it, that's sure a lot better than 43 cents an hour quite considerably isn't it Mr. Barberry, how about New Jersey? Well, we're very, uh, we're just as bad as the other two gentlemen just spoke on the left here. We have the same thing. We have a lot of young fellows that would like to stay on the farm, but the industry is so close in New Jersey that uh, they, they, they say there's no incentive to staying on the farm, and they just simply uh, give up because they see their fathers uh, in such uh, terrible financial distress that they just say there's no future in farming, so they just simply go into industry. And while not in industry, they get uh, hospitalization, pension plans, and uh, 40 hours a week, and uh, well, the young boys can't see it. And it's, it's a shame, even though the government, the, the uh, governor of New Jersey, uh, would like to keep more uh, land in what they call green acres in New Jersey. They would like to uh, keep it, but uh, they can't hold the farmers. Unless we uh, get a price very soon, we're going to lose a lot more. I, I should like to tell you that I honestly believe that you as consumers 
if you have followed this show, should be real concerned that in not the too distant future there will be a situation which we have been projecting now for a good many years where we might get in the place where it will be absolutely necessary to charge exorbitant prices for food in order to get agriculture back on its feet. The family, the family farming situation as it has been conducted for a good many years, has been a highly efficient type of a situation. We've outproduced the world. We give you production that other countries can't possibly get from their people or from their land. We've done this with a minimum of later labor and a minimum of income. But this condition can't go on. The NFO presents these figures to you for your consideration. You as consumers need to know these facts. You need to know that the dairyman who actually produces the milk is putting it on your doorstep for about eight or nine cents a quart. You need to know that the soybean situation is such that the oils you use should we have to get so sick that we're practically out of the picture and then bring in vast resources and money to get us established again would have to be much higher than the price of soybeans is now. The NFO collective bargaining program is one that asks for fair prices. It asks for cost of production plus a reasonable profit. We want that for all industries. We want it for farming. We'd like to have our children come back and farm. We'd like to encourage everyone's children to stay on the farm. And for those of you who are farmers, whatever your commodity is, you ought to ask the NFO about the collective bargaining program because we can offer you an opportunity to get together with us. Collective bargaining means bargaining together and selling together. Together we can do these things, and that's what it's going to take. It's been a real pleasure to talk with these gentlemen from all over the United States. It's a happy day when we will include the few remaining states in the NFO Collective Bargaining Program. Okay. U.S. Farm Report has presented NFO Roundtable. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. Every American can profit by the successful NFO Collective Bargaining for Agriculture, for farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity.